Well, let's get started. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for being here. I wasn't expecting so full crowd like that, so I hope you can enjoy some of the, the informations that I have to, to present here. Uh, my name is Mateus. I'm from Brazil uh, on a company called Cicred, which is a credit union. Um, just a few words about Cicred. Uh, Cicred is the first Brazil credit union founded in 92. So, and it's a pretty old company. Uh, it's one of the largest credit, credit, Brazil credit union with more than 7.5 million members. When we call members, this is a term to the credit union. It really means clients. So we have more than 40,000 employees and it's present on every Brazilian state. Um, it's important to mention that all, we, all our critical workloads, a great part of it, run inside Kubernetes infrastructure. So uh, things like instant payment and ATM operations, all that rely on, on applications that run inside Kubernetes. So just a few words about me. I'm a platform specialist at Secred, working for the container orchestration team. I'm in the company for almost uh, 18 years now. Uh, I'm a free software enthusiast. I was always involved with uh, free software open source projects. I was involved with Debian GNU Linux in the past, Debian GNU Herd, and OpenLDAP and app and stuff like that. So my job is really <laughs> replace proprietary systems with free software. I am a retired football player, who sometimes insists to play again. I regret every time because I got injured. I'm a father of two beautiful girls. It's a teenager and a child, so I'm not used to solve conflicts in Kubernetes upgrades. I'm also expert in solving conflicts at home. I'm a competitive Pokemon Gen 3 OU player. If you want what does mean, I am Shahua BHZ on PokemonShowdown.com. Uh, they said it's a, a child game, and it really is a child game. Sorry. Sorry, mom. Uh, I'm a football lover. I'm a supporter of the best team in Brazil, which is Clube Atlético Mineiro. We call them Galo, which means rooster in Portuguese. So, okay, let's go what it means, what is really important now. What do you see in this presentation? Well, we will have a brief introduction about the graduate infrastructure related to Kubernetes. Uh, our CFC mesh proof of concept run. Uh, how do we automate it our service mesh configuration? That's a pretty important point because we face a lot of challenges. Uh, just before we get started, really, how many of you here, if you can raise your hands, are using service mesh from in somehow? Okay. And how many of you are using Cilium cluster mesh? Okay. So, okay. People with Cilium cluster mesh will see, uh, I think, important things here. Uh, the challenges that we faced, the most difficult challenges, and our next steps. So I will start with the, uh, the infrastructure because it will be important to, to understand what we have done there. So we have a private cloud built on canonical OpenStack spread across three different data centers. That is our on-premise infrastructure. We have public cloud built on Amazon Web Services. Um, Kubernetes clusters manage it are managing using cluster API on a private cloud, and on AKS are managed by Terraform. Um, here we have, in, in Secret, we have the concepts of stacks for cluster. So each cluster have an what we call in a stack. What this really means is a repository in Git, GitLab, containing the information about the cluster configurations, setups, and stuff like that. So um, the Kubernetes clusters that manage it on premise are basically formed by a cluster API description of the cluster in a YAML format and some Ansible playbooks that, that run Ansible roles to install uh, clusters components like Cilium. Uh, on the AKS for the other side, we have uh, a stack of pure uh, Terraform using, of course, modulus like Helm modulus to install the components. Uh, we have a dedicated Amazon Direct Connect link with all data centers. This is great because the latency is very low, so we feel like we are operating in the same data center. Um, we have mo this, this number is a little bit outdated, but I didn't want to change this, this slide because I already had updated 
before, but we have more than 40 Kubernetes and AKS clusters. Uh, these numbers are, are um, an average numbers because as we have a horizontal pod outscaler and cluster outscaler, these numbers tend to change across the day, across the, the, the traffic. So, but in a medium, we have uh, 7,400 pods running in production and uh, 500 Kubernetes and AKS nodes running in production. I know I saw some huge infrastructure in other talks, and this made me think, oh, this is not so big, but for us is, is really um, a, a, a great number of nodes and pods running, and this thing keep growing. So the canonical open stack infrastructure will look like that. We have um, a, a region, and we have spread across of across availability zones, three availability zones. So the key points are stretch VLANs between data centers. So we have fully communication between them. Storage and storage is not shared or replicated among the zones. And OpenStack control planes are spread among the zones for uh, high availability. Uh, this is a very high level description. Uh, the the idea here is to pro is to show how what are the components that we have because we have some challenges and you will see further are related to these components, to someone, some of these components. So we have our data center connected with Amazon Direct Connect. Then we have a um, transit gateway and then we have a gator load balancer and behind that we have a, a Palo Alto firewall infrastructure to reach uh, AKS clusters. Of course, this flow is both direction. We have traffic coming from on-premise on data center and reaching AKS and AKS reaching on-premise data center as we work on a fully, uh, fully infrastructure. So a little bit about our CNI history. We born in, with Kubernetes in 2018 using Flannel. We changed to a project called Weave into, in uh, 2019. But due to some, prob due to some problems to, with Flannel and, and VXL on top of our infrastructure, um, but we saw that uh, Weavy was dying, uh, so and we had some problems with it. Uh, so we changed it to Silly in 2020, looking for the security features, eBPF, of course, and the more robustable, robust and stable CNI. So moving to Silly was very important because there was a lot of new applications uh, getting the cluster, and with more and more applications, security also become a problem. So. Most part of the applications were running on Kubernetes did not have any access control. The developers did not write any code to, to control that. And that was a big problem and auditing problem for us. So Samsung Mesh capability was of course an alternative to solve that problem without changing the source code. This is what Samsung Mesh works for, so makes sense. Uh, we started proof of concept by the end of 2020 on potential Samsung Mesh solutions that solve a particular problem. We wrote a sample application that was very similar to all other applications that we were we had running at that time in our Kubernetes infrastructure to make the tests. And we selected the following service mesh tools to evaluate which was the best. So at the time, Istio was the most preeminent service mesh tool. We had a very young project called Kuma, which is a service mesh by Kong, including they have some had some talks yesterday, I think. Unfortunately, I could be able to, I could not be able to, to watch. Uh, Cilium, of course, which was our CNI. And Console Connect, which also, which is the service mesh from Console because we are already using Console and some hash corporate tools to configuration and store secrets like Vault. Okay, what was the key point to us? Uh, of course, a feature to block or allow access from one application to another, this was the main point. We would like to have some layer seven security policy if, if, if this was uh, important. Uh, Multi-cluster policy capability, of course, at that time we are, were running multi-cluster, so this should work across multiple clusters. A uh, great part of the, the service mesh tools at that time used sidecars, so we were a bit worried about the resource consumption and we decided to do some kind of performance test with that sample application that we wrote. Uh, a low priority feature that we want to look at is mesh expansion. Uh, mesh expansion is just a way to work with 
workload that are not in Kubernetes, but you want this to be part of the of the service mesh, so you can enable this. You have some tools, to, some service mesh that implement this. This was not so important, but it's something that we would like to check. Uh, this is a basic uh, draw about the application that we wrote. It's a microservices application. We have the employee data connecting to employee proxy using RESTful services, then connected to two other services, uh, employee test A, test B, which connects to an LDAP database. Uh, the great point here is that we'd like to, to test if it was possible to put rules of in that connection points. That, of course, will solve the, the problem that we had. So the Istio service mesh uh, POC, uh, Istio access control works, policy works with authentication authorization using MTLS. It has the sidecar envoy intercepting all the traffic to apply effectively apply, apply the policies. Uh, as I said before, we were worried about uh, resource consumption because of that sidecar. It starts to show a good performance with no major, major problems. We could detect a, very, um, a little bit more resource usage, but that was not uh, an issue for us. We thought it would be worst. Uh, there was an issue at that time with mesh expansion and would like to test. The point important here that I would like to mention is that information is about uh, end of 2020. 2020 and 2021. So some of the service mesh listed here may have some bugs which are already solved or functionalities in them could be changed. I don't know, but this is what we run at the time. Uh, so Kuma was a very, very young project back then in 2020. We hit several problems that make it impossible to really do the tests. Uh, when we applied the policy to, to validate the access, the probes didn't work. So the applications never could get up and running. And unfortunately, we cannot be able to, could not be able to do, finish the test. This issue was solved by the end of 2020, but we already finished the proof of concepts. Well, uh, console connect, here is a very weird one. Sorry about this console. Console connect enforces policies by using side cars in the containers at that time, just like Istio. But we found very unusual configuration to enable that. An application to be protected needs to be bind only localhost, which is, we basically had to recreate all our images to applications bind only localhost if they want to be protected in the mesh. And this is most the, the weird one. Applications that access another need to access localhost. So, Employee data, in our example, employee data as accessing employee proxy, the configuration, the properties inside the employee data should point to localhost in the port. And if it, connect, if it connects to multiple services, you should still use localhost and different by port. I'm not sure if this is still working like that, but if it, yes, I don't know, it's really complicated. And then you, have, you need to put some annotations like, uh, connect service upstreams in the service name and the port and the optional data center is a concept on console and console agents should be installed on Kubernetes nodes. So uh, we can't do with all that. We want a little simple infrastructure. I'm not sure if this is the way they work now, but back then it was the way they worked. So oh, Cilium here. Um, Cilium work with Cilium network policies to allow and deny access without the need of sidecars. This is great. Multi-cluster policies works perfectly uh, with some requirements that pod IP CDR should not conflict. And of course, services must be deployed on all clusters which are part of the service mesh. This is if you want that, act, that, that services to be accessed from other clusters, of course. Uh, services discover uh, uses Kubernetes coordinates implementation, which is cool. Uh, cluster mesh observability using eBPF is awesome. We did a test using kubeprox replacement and it's rock. It's, you don't need to have kubeprox running in your environment and you can do a full eBPF thing. So the performance showed very good results without a sidecar. So, so there is an obvious answer to our question why we choose Cilium as our service mesh. Uh, clusters net, uh, network policies uh, cross cluster was exactly what we need to implement the security on our services. We don't need sidecars. 
we have the eBPF and it was already used as OCNI, so no need to install new software. When I mean no new software, when you enable Cluster Mesh, it will install new components from Cilium, but not a different sort of software. Like, for example, if we use Istio, there's a bunch of Istio controllers and Istio software that needs to be deployed. Um, Liz Rice gave a very good talk, I don't know, in the day two about Cluster Mesh, including the uh, she did an, uh, a demo, so I will pass this very briefly because they have more uh, information on that talk if you want to to take a look. Uh, here's the requirements. All clusters must be configured with the same data path mode. Cilium install may default to encapsulation, native routing. Uh, the native routing here is the fully BPF thing that uh, have very good performance. As I said before uh, earlier, Pod CDR ranges uh, in all clusters and now nodes must be non-conflict and unique. Uh, nodes in uh, all clusters must have IP connected with, between each other. Uh, the network between the clusters must allow the inter-cluster communication. Uh, this is what Cilium Cluster Mesh uh, really is, a very important part. When you enable Cluster Mesh, what really, what really happens is that um, Cilium, a component called the Cilium Cluster Mesh is installed in your, in your uh, kubesystem namespace. What is this? It's basically an ETCD. And what is the point of this ETCD? It's to store the service identities for all your services. And the agents of Cilium will connect on that ETCD to get that information. So if you have two clusters, the agents from one cluster will connect to the, in the other ATC, Cilium cluster mesh ATCD to get that information and make things work. But again, uh, Liz Rice did a very good explanation about that if you want to check out. Okay, here's a good, the, some important questions. Enable cluster mesh using Cilium CLI or Helm installation. Uh, how do you connect the clusters? How do you distribute that key secretly? And it's possible to automate our cluster mesh configuration when you look at this uh, Cilium documentation about Cluster Mesh, they will use Cilium CLI to do that. Uh, but we, we did a little different. And I think this is more appropriate when you're talking about a, an environment that is not a, a play environment, that's a really production environment. So Helm was easy to install CNI, so let's use Helm to manage Cluster Mesh installation and configuration. Uh, we are using Terraform and Ansible to fully automate the cluster mesh process. Uh, just to mention that in case of Terraform, we're using Helm models behind the scenes. But that stack that I said uh, earlier are changing uh, if you were applying this on our premise, on premise infrastructure or in Amazon infrastructure. Uh, we are using HashiCorp Vault. Now, HashiCorp, fantastic job with Vault and Console, but not with the mesh at that time. Uh, we are using HashiCorp Vault to store clusters connection information and its certificates and credentials. So there is a, in Helm, in Cilium Helm, there is an option called TLS Auto Method, which you, we choose Helm. This means that Helm will be generate, will be used to generate uh, and store the certifications and, and credentials. These also have other options like uh, Site Manager, if you want to do Site Manager to do that job or if you want to provide it yourself by hand. Uh, we need to generate a new certification authority that will be used across all clusters to sync cluster mesh uh, certificates and credentials in the story to vault. For each environment, we create an, uh, it have its own a, a, a certification authority. Um, all communication between the clusters are encrypted, so uh, these certificates are very, very important so you make things work properly. So here is a, a flow uh, of the automation process. Um, so we basically have a Terraform or Ansible, and there is a flag, uh, which is cluster mesh is enabled. Yes or no, if you know, okay, no do, don't do the configuration for cluster mesh and finish. If yes, then, if yes, then uh, it, we need to check if the certifications are, and the credentials are already on vault. If the answer is no, then it means 
that is a new cluster and having its, its server me cluster mesh enabled. So there is a um, Helm property, TLS auto enable and it's set to true. This is the default. So what will happen here is we'll generate all the certificates and credentials that you need and you store this uh, using the certification authority that we provided first and then we'll store it on Vault. Um, then it will store the information about that cluster specifically, what are the endpoints and the, the keys to, to, to access them. It will get the name of the clusters to connect from a list. It will get all the information in respect of that cluster, like connect, uh, the connection, the port, and the credentials stored on Vault, then it will apply on Helm. If, the, if there is uh, already a certificate is in Vault, this means that this service mesh is already uh, enabled and may be up and running. So we set the TLS auto enable to false. And that is big, pretty important because if we don't set this, what will happen is it will generate new certificates. And this will, if you have other clusters connected to it, it will uh, basically block all the other clusters from connect because we generate new keys. So your service mesh will stop working. Uh, just a short example, we have this Terraform. Uh, this is a, a, a main.tf from one stack of a, on a specific cluster. And we have an iteration about uh, the, the clusters list. And then we will get on Vault and get all the information about the cluster that we want to connect. Down there we have uh, uh, the check if this uh, certificates already exist in Vault. If not, it will set the TLS auto enable to to true and will generate certificates. If not, it will get the certificates from Vault. What we have in here is the local TF of that specific cluster. So we have this by environment, the flag enable cluster mesh, uh, on that which we can control if some environment could be false or true. And the in the connect cluster mesh, which is the list of that cluster, will connect uh, the other clusters that will connect. So, for example, if this is the stack for the cluster D, right, then in development environment, it will connect to cluster A and cluster B. In production, we will connect to cluster A, B, and C. And this is a major difference because if you run the, 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 what is in documentation using CLI, when you connect the cluster A to cluster B, the CLI do both way. They do cluster A to B and B to A. Helm doesn't work like that. So, when you put in your cluster D, for example, to connect to cluster A, you need to go into cluster A stack and put the cluster B. So this is pretty important. Okay, how you how users control Cilium uh, network policies in our case with Dev Console. So what is Dev Console? Dev Console is an internal developer platform, a solution for offering infrastructure resources from all platform product teams. So a developer when they when they need to start a new project, they he access the Dev Console and ask for a new project, give a name to the project. This will trigger a GitLab uh, repository and he can choose the templates. I, uh, he wants to develop using Java and, and Spring Boot. It create a template with Java and Spring Boot with a sample of GitLab CI that will do build, test, and deploy. And he can also configure the resource usage for that specific component, the uh, HPA, and stuff like that. So here is the a part of the screen is in Portuguese, but I will try to mention the most important point here. Um, so this is a screen for a service called Demo Dev Services KO 2-6. So um, here is the ingress and egress rules. So when a developer needs to access some of the some other some other API or their application, they have a button here which is called which as a new access new new a new request. Then he uh, types the name of the service that he won't connect. This will trigger uh, uh, like a, a, for the other team some kind of uh, approvement rules if the user is the, if the developers of that. API approve, so, so the access will be uh, will be okay. What this really does behind the scenes is creating ceiling network policies. So we have uh, that 
Cilium Network Policy for, for Demo Dev Services, KO to Dash 6, uh, having access from Demo Dev Services to Dash 6, and the other way around. So uh, this is basically what Dev Console do is create those policies in our clusters, and this is have, have and this policies applies to all all clusters that we have in ATS in an on-premise infrastructure. Uh, the challenges that we face, uh, this was the most difficult one. Palo Alto Fire was generate VXLAN drops due to a bug. So I mean, so if you have infrastructure using Palo Alto, uh, you should check this this document because we spend a lot of months on that. We were thinking that maybe the problem was in that Amazon components or gateway, and we tried to do, but the problem was on the Palo Alto, which was dropping the excellent packet. The, the solution was basically some kind of profile that they write there. I don't know really about Palo Alto, but our security team did that and it works. At that time, we have just our clusters in our on-premise data center talking to each other through cluster mesh really well and AKS talking to each other really well, but when they need to connect uh, to, to infrastructure that are on different data centers, it was not working. Uh, Cilium Asia at Memory Lake bug, this is, was pretty, pretty complicated. Uh, when you have the cluster mesh enabled and clusters are connected, the Cilium agent basically increases memories a lot and we don't have a limit to 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 Cilium agents, so they start to um, keep, uh, stop working our nodes because of the lack of the memory. Uh, cluster Connect and enable Cluster Mesh with, with Cilium CLI and Helm was a bit confused because of the lack of interoperability between the two, so they have an issue about that, but basically if you, in the past we connected our clusters using CLI, so okay, now we will do automation, so when, when you start to working with Helm, things become weird and then we saw that they are conflict they not work if you are working with cli you need to keep going with cli until the end and if you work with helm you just have to work with helm to to control that configuration uh, there was an issue on Cilium. i don't know if it's fixed it, it fixed it because we just work it with helm and uh, no use for Cilium cli anymore um, one point, important point, we had to disconnect everything and disable cluster mesh with CLI to get it working with Helm, so it was really complicated. Uh, with cluster mesh and self-discovery mechanism working, we are now able to deploy the same application on both cloud infrastructure. What happened now is when a developer creates a project, uh, it will be on, in one cluster or on on-premise or in Amazon. And you can migrate this from one side to another and from clusters to cluster. This is possible with Dev Console, but we cannot have the ability to run both in the same data centers, which is a very cool feature that we have with Cluster Mesh and we would like to use. So working will be done in Dev Console to enable this because uh, we do the deploying in the pipeline using Dev Console APIs. Uh, extend observability with Hubble and Grafana tools because of the BPF. We would like to use this a lot, but we use Dynatrace as a main observability uh, software right now. So this is something that we are discussing internally. Um, we would like to use Gateway API to split traffic and enable canary deployment. We need to see how this works in cluster mesh. So we don't we are studying and do some doing some tests. But uh, it's all that. I'm here for your questions. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you don't have enough time, my my LinkedIn is on the sketch, and you can reach me to more detail. There is a lot of things that we did when we, but we couldn't. I could not be able to speak just in 30 minutes here. But you can reach me to to find more. Hello. More things. Uh, just what, one quick question uh, regarding the. Uh, I'm here. Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, on-premises um, CDM cluster mesh config, uh, you are using no port or load balancer for that. If you are using load balancer to connect both cluster that's external or using metal LB for that? Uh, we are using, in OpenStack infrastructure, we are using the, L, the OpenStack LB 
and on on Amazon AKS we're using Amazon LB. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have one question. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, presentation. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to ask uh, what component uses the uh, VXLAN? So is it from the uh, Amazon Direct Connect or? Uh, I I'm not sure because that, that network part of the intercommunication inter between our on-premise data center and uh, uh, on-premise and Amazon is done by other team. Uh, so I really don't know the protocol, but I think uh, there is a lot of protocol because uh, Gator Load Balancer work on Geneve protocol, and but we could be able to connect VXLAN directly from one side to another. Uh, you can reach me out after I can ask this question for our network team. Thanks. And, and did you have any challenges with the IP management over the sites? Uh, yeah, uh, you need to control the the cluster IP CDR. And when you control that, uh, you you will not have problems. But if you don't control and get the same IPs from one cluster to another, this will give you problems. But we don't have faced any of them. Uh, have you done a lot of uh, traffic management uh, between your clusters? So the documentation states uh, every service needs to exist for that uh, traffic to do uh, I think essentially it's defaulted to round robin. Yeah. And then trying to um, do any kind of a. a what, what's your experience on that? Because at the moment I'm trying to be very declarative in my traffic management. Um, and I was, I was speaking with Marcel from Isovalent. We're thinking that uh, you could just not create a service in a cluster and it won't, and it'll go to the other clusters. I'm, I'm just curious if. Uh, we don't have any problem in traffic manage, but this is something that we need to, to do. Uh, all clusters should have the services, so Dev Console basically deploy, deploy all services in our clusters. Uh, we have our link is very with data, with Amazon is very good, so I don't I don't know if any of any problems of traffic manager between these connection points. But again, I'm not in the network team, uh, but I think if we had something, they had reported me. Hello, Mateus. Hello. Um, something we are dealing with is cluster mesh right now. Um, Brazilian company too, Stone. Oh, good. And okay, we understand that pod IP must not conflict, but services. How you deal with services? Because in the cluster mesh, if you have the same IP for services in our entire environment? Okay, there is no problem with services. You can have the overlapping IP address for IP for services. I mean, you can have the same services with, this, with the same IP on different clusters. That's not a problem. It uses the services just a ref, for a reference. What it cannot be uh, overlapping is the pod IP, which is the problem. If you had overlapping or same IP in the bo in both clusters or in your clusters in the cluster mesh, you have problems. But you don't need to to care about service IPs from our perspective. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hello and thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question if you have one node or even a cluster of Kubernetes uh, running behind NAT one or two or more. Can you connect those with uh, Serial Mesh? I think you can uh, because uh, I, I think there is a lot of net between our connectivity with Amazon. But the point is that VXLAN traffic should be enabled in all these components. It should, you, you should guarantee that you have VXLAN working on both. But I think it's working work well with, with NAT in this behind the clusters. Because this is our scenario. We have NATs in some parts in the communication between our own premise and Amazon. And it works well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
so you need to have non-conflicting uh, networks for ports, uh, but what if you initially had, do you have experience changing the network, port network on the cluster, on the kind of uh, fly without destroying and creating the cluster? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We had, when you enable this, the, when you put some port CDR, you need and you want to change. If, I mean, if you start with some CDR and you want to change, this is very complicated. We have to restart and re destroy every node to get a new one. So this, we passed to this in our test environments and it's kind of uh, annoying. But when the cluster is born with the right CDR, then you have no problems in our experience. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I appreciate having you here, guys. Thank you.